So the idea with this one is that um, I wanted to show you um, the tools of running online meetings. And I wanted to make it really clear at this point that I've chosen the four that I have just seen in various different communities and online, um, online groups as the ones that the majority of people have mentioned. Um, so CAS and BCS doesn't endorse any use of any particular product. Um, so I've I've picked out the four that I've seen the most. Um, there are lots of others. However, if I put in all of the different uh, VoIP applications, you would be here for approximately four hours um, and I'd have 100 slides. So we thought we'd just look at these four major ones and give you a bit of a rundown of what you can actually do with them. Now, I noticed um, that with uh, connecting to a calendar, especially when we are talking about our online meetings, they were really, uh, really powerful in terms of getting people actually here. So when you signed up to this webinar, the first thing you got was, do you want to add this to your calendar? And it gives you a reminder. Um, so when you are running your online CAS um, communities, what you want to really be looking for is making sure that you can actually get uh, your, uh, your people there and remind them that it's happening because there is so much else going on with their lives. So all of these tools um, all have the ability for you to set up a meeting, pop that into the calendar and then invite other people. Um, it was interesting to look at the maximum group size and actually our CAS communities, you know, we, we would maybe have a, sort of a maximum of maybe sort of 40 to 50 people. Um, so all of these would be absolutely fine in terms of uh, bringing people in um, for our own communities. One thing I did notice um, in terms of um, having lots of people in there was actually the ability for us to have them either in one big room or for us to break out into smaller sections. And I'm going to come back to that later, but I'd like you to think about as you're um, being CAS community leaders, you are going to have people who are primary, uh, key stage three, secondary, and also our sixth form teachers as well. Um, and maybe our primary teachers aren't going to want the same um, interaction from their CAS meetings as you would get from a sixth form teacher. So the ability to work in small groups is really powerful for us. Um, and a lot of the things I'm going to be presenting to you here are very much to do with running meetings for adults, not something that you would want to use as an online classroom. Uh, so there's a lot less in terms of safeguarding here. Um, Waiting rooms has been the big thing that I've been um, shouting about for a while. Um, so in terms of waiting rooms, um, we have um, our Zoom um, and Skype. Now I'm talking about the free Skype rather than Skype for business. There are certain things in Skype uh, for business and the free one which are completely different um, then there's teams and you can have a waiting room for uh, for hangouts but you need to add this as an add-on so um, I've noticed that we've got a couple of people oh okay yep I'm picking up that we've got people who are either picking in and out that's okay we haven't got any hands up okay um for the waiting rooms, this is going to be one of the big things um, that stops people from, and you've probably heard the term Zoom bombing, um, and I'm going to come back to that in a little bit, but this prevents people from coming into the meeting that you haven't invited. Um, and it's something um, that passwords don't really do because you have to send out passwords, um, but having a waiting room allows you to prepare your meeting, have everybody logged on and ready, and then let people in as you see them. Um, and again, file sharing, you're going to see in absolutely all of them. And for your meetings specifically, being able to control people's videos um, and their ability to chat, again, is really, really powerful. So all of these um, have absolutely everything built into them. Um, and you can see one of the reasons why we don't really say use one particular thing is because this is going to be very specific to either your school uh, depending on what they have provided you um, or your particular setting. And the only thing that one has that the rest of them really don't is that Zoom has the non-verbal communication. Um, and actually in GoToWebinar, we also have our non-verbal communication because you can pop your hands up 
um, and you can also um, send us um, notifications for when you are um, not actually on the screen and you're doing something else, um, which is really, really fun, um, especially in if you're using this uh, for a class um, and you can see that people are not actually um, on that particular application. You get a little notification next to their name. So I'm going to start this one with um, tips for large meetings. So I've been running online classes and webinars um, and all sorts of things um, for quite a long time. Um, I've been doing webinars now for the last two years. So running large meetings with, um, with lots of people on them um, has enabled me to create a bit of a top tip for you. Um, so if you have the ability to have two screens, please do it. It's going to make your life a lot easier. Right now, I have this presentation running on this screen over here, um, and I actually have all of my other webinar software running here. Um, Zoom meetings and Skype meetings and Teams meetings are a little bit different because you can have everything all on one, um, all on one page, um, but it does allow you to have the things that you don't want people to see off to one side. Um, if you have a laptop, you can plug in an additional screen. Um, if you can, um, one of the really useful things is as people come in, start with, as you being the presenter or the host of your meeting um, with your presentation shared. Even if that is a presentation saying, welcome to our CAS community and tell them what they're about to expect. Um, so no different to what you would normally have up on the board. Um, just turn it into a visual, um, a, a virtual version of your classroom. Um, waiting rooms, and, and again, I'm going to come back to waiting rooms. I will keep banging on about waiting rooms because they are the best thing in terms of security that we have. Um, and then finally, um, using a headset. You can see that I'm using um, a, a one ear headset because otherwise I can't hear what I'm saying, um, but it does prevent echo. So anything that um, is being said back to me, especially if I'm in an interactive meeting, isn't then going to be heard by my microphone. Um, so usually, and in fact, I think you can also see my webcam. So I'm gonna bring in the ridiculous piece of tech um, that I use for recording. Um, and you can see I have a, quite a substantial microphone going on there. Um, but if I was using that with the speakers, it would actually pick up what other people were saying and it causes horrible echo for meetings. So headsets are really good. Um, and having people muted to start off with. Um, I have set up majority of my meetings so that when people arrive, um, they can't talk. And actually, this is where you are at the moment. You're all muted. But that's because this is a webinar. Um, the idea with your interactive meetings would be that somebody would be able to put their hands up. Um, they could then unmute themselves to then speak. Um, and it allows people to speak in turn because, because we don't have that in-person interaction and you, um, you don't always pick up on uh, people's body uh, language. Um, it does mean that people talk over each other a lot more. Um, Breakout rooms for smaller conversations. And again, I'm going to come back to breakout rooms because these are one of the most effective things that we can have um, as part of our larger CAS community meetings. And finally, and I'm sure you've all seen these things on, um, on YouTube and all over social media, please don't forget you are on camera, even if you're not speaking. Um, I have joined some of the most hilarious meetings where people aren't really listening and we can tell. Okay, so I'm going to look at managing participants and then I'm going to look at waiting rooms and we'll stop for some questions. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them directly into the chat um, and I will um, try and answer them as soon as I can. Um, if you have questions to do with what we're talking about here, but you want to make them specific to how you could implement them, please do pop them in. Okay, so allowing video. So there are two ways of um, thinking about this, that there are positives and negatives. Remember with your CAS communities, you know, we, we are all going to be adults. Um, we're all teachers. We are perfectly aware of um, some of the pitfalls. Um, but having your camera on um, stops you from feeling that you are um, alone in that room. Um, and a lot of us are becoming a little bit more isolated and it's becoming a little bit more difficult to communicate when we're, when we're just typing to each other or we're just hearing this sort of disconnected voice. Um, however, 
creating that personal connection then also makes it sort of feel like a real meeting um, and you can see there um, and I wonder if you can try and sort of place spot the holly in that one um, you can utilize some of these um, to create sort of this was our CAS community um, taking a photo of all of, all of your, your grid of photos um, use it to promote your community to other people um, obviously um, make sure that everybody has agreed before you take a screenshot um, and I can see, oh, go to questions pane. I've got some questions. I shall come back to those. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that um, having your cameras on does create additional bandwidth. And we do have to remember that our teachers, um, our members of our community um, are working from home. Not everybody is going to have unlimited internet. Um, consider in terms of forgetting you're on camera, suggesting that people do things like blurring their background. Um, you can see at the moment, my background's completely clear, but then I am in my office. Um, one thing to just bear in mind is that although our CAS communities are made up of um, IT specialists, they're made up of people who are teaching computing, um, not all of them will have um, brilliant IT knowledge in terms of working online because it's very much a disconnect. Um, and finally, I'm going to use the word Zoom fatigue. It's really not Zoom fatigue. It is um, video fatigue. Um, that is that actually a lot of us are finding it um, quite tiring to be constantly talking in these meetings. Um, it is um, caused by the intense nature of uh, a video calls and that is because we don't pick up on the subtle body language cues because you are just a sort of a disembodied head okay i'm gonna have a quick look at some of these questions excellent stuff um Okay, so with my live lessons for school, I found I seem to raise my voice louder than I would do if I was talking uh, to somebody on the phone. How do you overcome this? Um, I would say that would be practice. Um, I did find that the, f the first few times that I did, um, I, I did that Zoom communication or I did sort of a Skype call. Um, I, I find myself if I'm talking, and I'm going to make sure she's, she's yes, she is muted. Um, if I'm talking to my Alexa, um, I do. I shout at people when we drop in. Um, Jane, you will be able to see each other's questions if they have put them openly. Um, so yes, um, questions, if you put them into the chat, you will be able to see absolutely everything. Um, it is at the bottom right hand side. Um, and Yes, so the other things that um, we could be aware of, obviously, you know, I, I know that STEM are using things like Adobe Connect. Um, so I'm going to be just showing this as a, a general idea for VoIP. OK, how do you manage an informal chat coffee time session to share practice? OK, so I'm going to try, I'll try and embed that into um, into this area. Um, so when I talk about CAS communities, I'll add in some informal chats as well. Um, but again, try and be aware that if we're doing lots of this, uh, oh, okay, right. So chat window is not working. That's absolutely fine. So pop all your questions in and what I'll do is I'll read them out. Um, so um, in terms of this, I will add in those informal meetings as well. The Google Meet add-on, um, is um, is actually called waiting room. So when you have uh, your, I believe you have to put it into Chrome because of the way that, uh, that, that Google works. In Chrome, you have an add-on and you then just want to say uh, that what you want is an additional add-on to the screen. Um, and on top of that, you then want to have your waiting room added. And I will explain why in just a second. And I'm actually gonna keep the, these open down here. Okay, right, so let's move on a little bit. So waiting rooms. Now waiting rooms has been something that I've been using uh, for tuition and also for uh, groups for the last couple of years. Um, it's the word Zoom bombing it has, has started to make me twitch a little bit. I'm going to call it video bombing um, because it doesn't just happen to one platform. Um, we are very much less likely 
to find that we get this, um, this issue with our CAS communities. However, never say never. Um, and it's useful information to pass on to the people who come to your communities. So video bombing, if you haven't come across it, is a little bit similar to photo bombing. So essentially an unwanted person appears in the meeting without your permission. Um, and um, one thing to obviously be aware is that a lot of people who are doing this are sharing some un unpleasant vulgar content. We don't want that shared with anybody, let alone our kids. Um, so top tips for delivering the very first online session. OK, firstly, set up your waiting, waiting room. What this does is it allows you a couple of minutes before people come in just to prepare, get yourself prepared, make sure that everything's running, make sure your screen is shared. Um, and what they will see is what you can see on the screen. So I'm going to show you what they look like in a number of different VoIP applications. So um, I've been, We've left out the D, but it does let people uh, test out their sound. So get people to test their computer audio if they're coming into a meeting, make sure their video is running, make sure everything's allowed. Um, if you do want to have your uh, Google Hangouts one uh, set up, yes, you have to have the add-on before you start running the meeting. Um, but you can set up the meeting before you've got the add-on. It's just before you actually launch it. Um, so this is what Zoom would look like. I have um, my own all setups. This is my personal meeting room. I actually have a little set of tips um, that I tell uh, my, this, obviously this is set up for students. Um, so making sure they've got their pen and their calculator, um, turning off their social media, that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to come back to Ellie's question in just a second. Um, Skype for Business has very similar. Um, you'll have a virtual lobby, which is basically a waiting room. So you're not allowed in until the person who's running the meeting says that you are. Um, and then you can see this one. Uh, we've got Teams as well. So because you are manually letting people in, what that does is if you don't recognize the name, um, they won't be allowed to come into your meeting. So um, as an example, I run um, meetings for local teachers um, and I had one whose child had been, um, had been using it. Um, they used a, a rather um, well-known president's name as their screen name and ultimately I didn't let them in because I didn't know who that was. Um, it could have been anybody. Um, it turned out they were fine but it did just prevent that issue that could have arisen. So, Ellie, you, that was really good timing. So, how do you encourage more introvert community members to be brave enough to ask questions? So, screen sharing. This one is really where it sort of comes into its own in terms of having online meetings. So in terms of, and this is quite good for your coffee mornings as well. So if you want to start by getting people used to the concept of using uh, webcams, because of course the first time you use a webcam, you are just going to be looking at your own camera, checking your hair, making sure you've put enough makeup on. Um, I did this for ages and ages. Um, and now, um, as you can see, I really don't care anymore. Um, I'm just out there on, on webcam. Um, you can have your presentation, that's quite formal. Um, you can also have a second camera um, for demonstrations. So if you're going to do something using a pen and paper um, or you want to have whiteboards, you can have another um, version of your webcam. Um, Pair programming and training. So what you can do, if you have introvert community members um, who don't really want to share openly with a group, you can put them into smaller breakout rooms where they're maybe with sort of two or three other people, allow them to get used to the video chat in that section, and then come back as a larger group. So I found my introvert um, students and also the teachers that I'm working with um, will potentially talk more in their small groups. Um, or they would use the text facility. So you don't necessarily have to be uh, chatting like we are um, now with just text and me in a room talking, but you can create sort of a hybrid of lots of people talking and other people texting at the same time. Um, and finally, for what you are looking for in terms of things that are maybe a little bit um, bit more fun, so if you're doing like your coffee mornings um, or you're just introducing your CAS community members to how to use something, um, 
quizzes. Quizzes are amazing. We are so good as teachers for running these quizzes. Um, you know, we could run an online Kahoot. Um, and I know, I know everyone cringes the minute you say that word, um, but they are really fun. Um, I've been getting students to actually create them for their families um, and then sharing their screen and everyone's on their phone doing their weekend family quiz. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't do that with your CAS community. Um, so having the screen share option also gives you the ability for you to have uh, presenters. So like today, um, I have the entire hour set out. Um, however, if you don't want to be that person talking for an hour, and believe me, it's, it's, you'll be shattered by the end of it, um, get people to also share their screens as well. So you can provide that ability to other people. So maybe get some of your people who are a bit more extrovert uh, to come up with a 10 minute um, session that they could present as part of your community meeting. Um, a couple of tips in terms of sharing desktop. Um, because we can talk about things like live programming demonstrations, um, and I was doing one of those um, as a, a live stream on YouTube this morning, be really careful to close your other programs down first. You don't want to have your emails up. You don't want to have the little pop-ups that you get, so make sure wh of which screen um, you are sharing. But it does mean if you put them into their own little breakout rooms, they can share their own screens and you can do things like pair programming um, or collaborative development of resources. So if you wanted to put people together and they were to uh, maybe write a, an idea for a lesson plan together, they could do that in their small breakout rooms or you could do that as a huge thing um, as your, your whole um, community. Okay, I'm going to pop back to some questions. Um, so, do you use Google Docs to support discussion by typing and then you have a record of the discussion rather than losing it on chat? Um, a lot of these VoIP applications will allow you to download the chat um, as a text file. So, um, you can do that um, in pretty much um, all of the applications I've shown you today, um, you can download that chat as a text file. Um, alternatively, absolutely, use Google Docs, use a collaborative document. You can use um, Office 365 to do the same. It does depend on who's got access. So if you're talking about something which is um, maybe a little bit more sensitive, then use obviously the inbuilt chat. Can you screen share in Teams? Absolutely, yes, you can. Um, Hopefully. Right. So the next bit. Have I tried Microsoft Whiteboard? Yes, it's amazing. I absolutely love Microsoft Whiteboard. Um, the only thing I would say is if you are going to collaborate on a whiteboard, um, inside your, uh, even inside a, a community meeting, do it with a, a small group of people. So only give, um, say, maybe two or three people access. Because if you've got 10 people writing all over a whiteboard, it gets really, really frustrating. Um, but yes, Microsoft Whiteboard, especially as a, uh, a way to, to mind map your meetings, is absolutely incredible. And I would definitely use it in the actual classroom as well. Um, the other thing I will do, because you can obviously see my uh, webcam, is grab yourself one of these. This is my graphics tablet um, that um, I told everybody that I would definitely never buy. Um, and it's really, really useful, especially for whiteboards. Um, and can you use Teams for people outside your organization? Absolutely, yes, you can. Um, as long as you have their email um, linked to you, so you have them as a contact, you can set them up. So what I did um, is I dragged in some very unwilling victims, um, also known as my family, um, to come and show you what screen sharing looks like in a variety of different VoIP applications. So hopefully this is us looking really happy to be using Zoom. Um, so on here, if you are uh, screen sharing, you can see on Zoom, you would screen share using the green button at the bottom. You've got the option of sharing your screen, but also a single application. And that stops other things from popping up that you don't want people to see. But it also has a second camera, which I particularly like. Um, yes, £35 for a Wacom one is absolutely incredible. Um, so you can see there I was sharing my screen and you still get to see everybody's webcam as well. So even though you might be presenting or somebody else is presenting um, using Zoom, uh, you still get to see like a little grid of cameras. Um, and then, of course, you can go back. Um, you can see on there, um, I've also 
um, hidden all of the mess in my office by having a virtual background. So obviously Zoom is not the only one and I wanted to make sure you had um, an example of lots of them. So let's have a look. So this is Sky us using Skype. This was the free version of Skype. Um, and I did notice there were a few little things um, which I thought might be useful for you to be aware of as part of your community meetings. Ah, breakout rooms. Lindsay, I'm going to come back to breakout rooms um, at the end and I'm actually going to show you a proper version of how to do it. Channels and teams are complicated. Yes, indeed. Um, I'm going to come back. OK, so screen sharing in Skype, you can see there. I can see myself in as a little, um, little version. You can only in the free version of Skype share a whole screen. So I would have to select one of my two monitors. So everybody now knows that I'm using um, dual monitors. Um, and at this point, I was able to, um, to share my screen um, and Tom was able to see it. And I had to actually ask him if he could see my screen share because there was nothing to actually intrinsically tell me it was uh, sharing. And the other thing is if you click on the sharing button, um, it doesn't necessarily work. You have to click on the text. Um, however, it does um, allow you to, um, to I'm just saying, oh my God, stylus and graphics tablets are amazing. I got one the other week and I use it instead of my mouse. Absolutely. I, I just, I, I love my graphics tablet. I was always that person who said, no, don't be ridiculous. It's, it's, it's so silly. Um, and I, I just eat my words completely. Um, so yeah, there we go. There, there, is our, um, there is our Skype version. Um, this is for Teams, because I know that you, you did say, could you share a screen in Teams? This looks very similar. Um, and actually what they are doing at the moment is Microsoft are moving people more towards Teams than, um, than Skype. Um, however, uh, working in a very similar way, notice on this one, I couldn't put in uh, the automatic captions. Um, so Skype has this really nice uh, ability for people to actually run um, automatically generated um, automatic generated captions. Now Teams gave me the option of sharing a particular application. And even when I moved that application around between my two screens, um, it still allowed everybody else to just see that screen without it moving. Um, I was really impressed by that. Um, and uh, it did make, make that uh, mean that I could actually move things around. I could organize my screen without interrupting the flow um, of what they were seeing. Um, and that was really, really useful for me. Okay, I'm just going to pop my chat down here. Okay. And finally, Google Hangouts. Um, so this was the final one that I tested out. Um, and Google Hangouts there, um, this allowed me to share my screen. Um, it was done in the browser, though. So you do have to, you go up and you, you click on share screen, and then it asks you um, to confirm that you do want to share. Um, even if you have checked that option um, a number of times, sometimes um, it will come up um, that it wants you to confirm again. OK, um, and the nice thing about this one is that it gives me that great big green panel across the top to say you are sharing your screen. Um, again, with Hangouts, you can only share your entire screen rather than a single application. So you do have to be very careful about what you have up on your screen. Um, however, um, using native um, Chrome sh screen sharing is great. Is Hangouts the same as Meet? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, Google Meet is the embedded version, I believe, um, but it uses the same um, same Hangouts application. Um, but you can see there, when I was screen sharing, it actually showed me what I was sharing, but it was so tiny, um, it was quite difficult to, to work out what it was. However, knowing it was the whole screen made it a little bit easier. So screen sharing is um, is really useful it's something that I think in terms of our um, our CAS communities we can embrace um, and we can really kind of talk about um, how we can make that work for us so try and consider the different um, interactive ways that you can share your screen so if you are talking about um, Ah, fabulous. There we go. So in um, in Meets, they've actually improved that slightly. So you, you can you can share a tab 
or your whole screen, which I think would really make a, a massive, massive difference. Um, I was always a little bit nervous about the applications that insisted I shared my entire screen, um, especially when we're talking about teachers who maybe have um, lots of um, you know, we, we've got lots of student data, we've got lots of personal data on our machines, and we still need to be very aware of uh, data protection, GDPR, um, and not having any of this information available um, when we share our screens. Um, it is something that I've noticed um, over the past few weeks that we keep forgetting about, not so much in terms of the CAS community, um, but as a generalised teaching community, we're sort of, we, we've got, we've got, had so much put on top of us um, that, um, we just need to cut, maybe pull back a little bit and remember um, that we still need to be careful about what we're sending out across the internet. I'm going to come back to these questions because these are brilliant. Um, so, um, brilliant. So, Vicky's actually already used this for a CAS meet um, and shared a tab. Brilliant. Um, and then we have, uh, so I set up Teams meeting from my iPad, but the video icon was missing at the bottom um, and you had to start it from your laptop. So, you can start a meeting from a tablet and from a phone, um, but you are constrained by um, what, the, uh, what the app can do. So be really aware when you are actually starting your meetings that the person who is hosting the meeting will constrain it to um, that particular device's abilities. So if you are running it from an iPad, you will find that things like screen sharing um, will be missing um, because it is an app rather than the full desktop application. Um, and they do that because obviously the desktop applications are much larger. Um, and the native ability to share a screen on things like um, tablets and, and, and smartphones um, is it requires a lot more in terms of being uh, allowing the app to uh, to access um, and a lot of apps won't do that um, and a lot of the app stores and, and play store um, they don't like those applications to do it so if you are running your meeting make sure it's from a laptop, make sure it's from a desktop. Be aware, especially with your camera, um, that um, things like doing uh, the blurred backgrounds and, um, and messing about with the, the virtual backgrounds, it takes up a lot of processing power as well. Um, you know, I'm really lucky that actually I work um, completely online now and I work from home, so I have quite a ridiculous setup. Um, that means that I can run things. I have invested in um, a webcam that costs a small fortune, <laughs> um, but then I'm using it every single day. So if you are using a webcam which is perfectly acceptable for video calling, um, you may find that actually things like virtual backgrounds don't work. Okay, I did a training session at CAS meeting last week where I presented on Google Meet. You had an Android tablet and a second camera. Oh, amazing. Um, Yes, absolutely. So you can plug in second cameras um, to your uh, to your devices as well. Um, so as long as you've got, so I think what you would have to do, and I believe, Spence, what you probably did is when you joined, did you join as two separate, the same account, but on two separate devices? So you had the ability to screen share and, and have your camera? Yes, two devices. Yes, you can join these meetings with multiple devices. Nonverbal communication, um, which is what we have here. Um, and this particular thing, um, if I go to our attendees, I'm actually going to get you to try this. Um, can you go into, uh, you should be able to pop your hand up. I'm going to get everyone to use a piece of nonverbal communication and put your hand up. Hey, there we go. Perfect. And as the presenter, I'm then able to see um, who's got their hand up. Um, I can see that those people have a question um, and some of our VoIP applications um, have the ability for us to um, include this non-verbal feedback. Um, I noticed with some of them um, that what they've done is they built it directly into the participants. So um, in uh, this one, um, I'm showing you Zoom and Zoom unfortunately at the moment is the only one that really has this specifically built in um, and that's because originally it was actually developed as um, an online webinar platform 
um, and, and specifically for training. Um, so therefore, when we uh, when we started using it for things like um, tuition and meetings, it was already there. Um, some of the other VoIP applications are starting to bring this in now. Um, and you'll notice that in Hangouts um, and in Skype, you can actually put little emojis uh, to say what you're doing. And also in Teams, you've now got the ability to put thumbs up and thumbs down. Um, I particularly like this version and it's only because I like the ability for my people in community, especially for the CAS communities, to be able to click that I need a break button. Um, we were talking at the beginning about um, this sort of over video overload um, that we get and we can find and I certainly find when I'm doing things like this is that um, potentially I go too fast because I've got my PowerPoint in front of me I know what I want to say um, and because I'm not getting that verbal feedback and the ability to stop and actually physically talk to people um, I do find that sometimes I go a little bit too fast so there is something on here that says go slower go faster um, and the I need a break. Um, I'm going to come back. Awesome. Look, we've got some more. So I use the hands up or other emotions to always confirm that people can see my screen. Yes. Or when I switch applications to see it. So the programming software. Yes. It's also really useful for uh, participants to see each other's. Um, Yes, to be, able, to be able to see what other people are saying. So that thumbs up is really, really powerful. Um, I, I quite like to use this with students because even though they are watching maybe a live lesson, it means that they feel that they are involved. Um, hands up, not so much, um, but the uh, the tick and the cross. So did, did you understand this? Is it, would you like me to go back over this? Are you ready? That kind of thing. Um, it really allows them to feel that they are actually involved in the meeting. Yes, exactly. It, it is absolutely essential for this social cohesion, um, because what we are now doing is we are developing ways not just with our communities, um, but with all of the meetings that we're running, um, we are developing a new way of communicating. Um, so, oh, we've been doing a dual meeting with two CAS reps, meaning someone can keep an eye on the chat and the other can present. That's brilliant. I mean, Vicky, what, what you're doing there is the perfect way of actually working together. Um, it can be completely overwhelming. Um, the first few times, and in fact, the first probably hundred times, um, to present something like this, also to keep an eye on the chat, also to make sure that your PowerPoint's working, um, and also to just keep talking. So therefore, having two people, I mean, that, that's just a, a great idea for the, for the CAS communities. If you can have two people who support each other, who know what's coming up, and then potentially swap either halfway through or just kind of swap every sort of 15 minutes to give the other one a break, that's been really, really helpful. Um, so having somebody else, even if you are the CAS uh, community leader, having somebody who's also supporting you is, uh, is absolutely essential. There we go. So you can ask your community outreach manager to support you. So from being a navigator to deal with the chat and the questions or even to take over with the hosting. Absolutely. So use the fact that you know, we are a CAS community. So therefore, there will be lots of people who will support you. Um, and even if you do feel um, that there are lots of people who are local, who would normally be in your community, um, who may be a little bit busy at that point or who don't feel confident to do that, um, we're now online. So you can reach out to the wider community as well to, to help you uh, to run these meetings. Um, oh, wow. So, uh, yeah. So having a student or participants to take the role of mediator is also useful. So this makes people feel that they're involved. Absolutely. So your communities are not a webinar. It is not just you presenting. Um, so get people involved. Get them to look at the chat. Remember that um, if you're running this as a VoIP meeting, everyone can see the chat. Um, so you want them to feel involved. Um, so this non-verbal communication um, can be can be really, really powerful. The only one that I wasn't wholly keen on um, was the ones where you could actually have emojis in there um, and there was one that I noticed um, on a platform that shall re remain nameless where you could roll your eyes at the person presenting and that was terrible I, I, I actually looked at it and went oh how would I feel as a presenter if people were putting that um, emoji on um, and it almost gave me a little bit of an insight into how people feel when they're actually watching their live streams with all, all of the sort of the angry faces that pop up. 
Um, so it, it was an interesting insight into um, being a presenter and then, then moving that forward. Creating polls. This one um, was really interesting because I hadn't done an awful lot of creating polls. And over the last maybe sort of four or five weeks, I've really got into doing this with um, not just uh, meetings, but actually within uh, webinars as well. So um, creating polls for this one is going to be one of the areas where um, you can really get people involved. Um, Excellent. Somebody has uh, was using this with undergraduates um, and someone used a dodgy emoji, uh, but I and everyone else knew exactly who they were. It was hilarious. Brilliant. <laughs> I like that. Um, so polls will allow you to, I mean, you obviously you know how to use polls. As, as teachers, it, it's just something that, that we've been doing for a long time. But in your CAS community meetings, you could just get a general feel for a subject. Um, you can confirm understanding of maybe something that you're presenting. Um, or where we have created um, a lot of these communities where we actually have a choice of what we want to do. Um, you also have the ability to um, maybe vote on meeting choices. So you might have prepared a number of different things and actually pull them out into uh, into different areas. Oh, I have a message on here. Nope. Nope. There we go. Back to the questions. Okay. Um, and then also your meeting feedback. You're going to want to gather in some feedback um, at the end of your meeting um, to either feed that back to CAS or to make improvements. Um, and using a poll at the end is quite nice um, because it just gives everyone that sort of final little section. Um, so you can make polls in basically any of the VoIP applications. They all use different things. Um, Zoom has one built in. You go onto the website and you can set them up in advance. I quite like that. Um, the other thing you can do, this is what it actually looks like on the day. So you can ask all the questions. You can make them anonymous. Um, so the polls are dependent um, in terms of uh, whether they're third party or, or built in. So for Zoom, they're actually built in um, to the application. Um, you can make them anonymous, you can make them um, visual as well, so you can actually see who's, who said what. Um, but be aware, if you don't make them anonymous, everybody can see what they've answered. Um, in terms of Skype, Skype has this built in um, and you can create polls um, again. This is but this is done in within the app. Um, so Skype for business. I quite like the idea of this one where the choices are color coded. Um, that maybe appeals to my sense of needing everything nicely ordered. Um, and again, you can make these anonymous or not. Now, Teams and Hangouts actually use the same third party piece of software. Um, and they use a thing called Poly or Poly. Um, so Teams includes the, uh, the Poly third party uh, piece of software where you can go in, you can create your polls, you can have multiple choice, you can have them open ended. Um, with Teams has a little bit more in terms of being able to uh, provide um, feedback um, and you can actually download it as a form as well. Um, so with this one, um, Poly is used to create your uh, your polls um, and then Polly is also used in Hangouts but it's done directly in the chat so having that second person at this point is really really helpful because they would have to um, to, to run in so yes um, if you are using Hangouts or you are using Teams you would have to install that extension um, but you can see there if you do at Polly um, inside your chat it's really quite fun um, so have you come across a nice, easy to use wiki software, which people can use to collaborate and produce a shared resource? Oh, um, I think that one, again, that would depend upon um, what you are using as a, as a school or as a community. Um, there, there are lots of things in there. I know obviously you can have a Moodle um, which um, you create um, a wiki in. Um, you can create online wikis as well. Um, in terms of a collaborative resource, um, I would probably be leaning more towards actually creating things like Google Docs um, so that you can share it around, you can see the history. Um, okay, so I'm going to come back to what a channel on Teams is in just a second. 
but yes, in terms of your, um, your shared resources, um, look at the way that you would want to collaborate on a document. Look at what you are trying to achieve in terms of um, the resource you are creating, because that resource could be anything from maybe a video to a lesson plan to printed out worksheets uh, or just essentially ideas of how to implement this. Um, so pick the resource based upon uh, what it is that you are trying to create. So a channel on Teams is basically uh, where you are, um, if you imagine you're organising people into a sense. So I, I have channels where we have had conversations with specific people and then I can move on to a different channel who I have my other people set up. So if you imagine it's a bit like a group chat that you can come back to again and again um, and you can share your chat. Uh, you can also share files with that particular group. So imagine instead of a channel, you call it um, a, a group. So we've got, I'm using Google Docs, but it gets complicated for large group collaborations. It does, you're absolutely right. If you're talking about lots and lots of people, um, then you may well want to start looking at using something like Moodle for, um, for a, a wiki. Um, but yeah, it, it very much depends on what it is that you're using, using this for. Finally, and I promised you I would look, talk about breakout rooms. Um, I need to just be um, aware of um, breakout rooms uh, are only at the moment available in, um, in Zoom. Um, it was a feature that has been requested for Teams, and I know that that has been put forward, and it is with their development team. Um, I don't you, I don't know. I don't think you can do this in Meet. Um, Adobe Connect definitely, definitely have them. Um, so of the four that I am presenting. Um, this is the only one that allows you to have breakout rooms. Um, but yes, Adobe Connect definitely has them. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that I would only ever use this for the community meetings. Um, so if you have adults, brilliant. If you have um, teach training, fabulous. If you're going to have students in there, unless you are placing a member of staff in each of the breakout rooms, I wouldn't use it um, purely from a safeguarding perspective because you can't keep an eye on what they're saying. So let's see how I made my poor children, <laughs> my husband, go into their rooms. Um, so in this case, what I did is I set up a specific number of rooms. I set them manually so that I could place them into their groups. This is basically just like your group work that you would be using in your classrooms. Um, so off these two went into their room. Um, so I assigned them um, and I opened them. They get a little... Um, little link to say go off into your room you can assign them a certain amount of time now one of the things I was thinking about for um, certainly for the communities that I've attended because we've had people from all different areas um, you could potentially have your GCSE teachers off in one area you have your primary teachers in another and you have your presenters who wanted to present one particular thing people could then vote using your polls to say what it is that they want to actually go and, and do and then using that poll you can then assign them into their breakout room so they can then go and do their CPD with that person who's presenting to a much smaller group. Um, that person can share their screen, they can get other people to share their screen or they can just have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, you as the person who is uh, running the meeting can then go into and join each of those breakout rooms and you can sort of pop in and see how they're doing, uh, much like you would do if you went into a, a different classroom or a different table. Um, and you can then go back into the main meeting. Once you're back in the main meeting, you can actually send um, warnings to absolutely everybody. Um, so you can see here what I'm doing is I'm then going back the big blue button has breakout rooms. I think we used the other week for a conference. Um, there is a maximum of six rooms. Um, you can actually have more than six rooms now um, because of um, the, the amount of things that, that uh, the people are doing. They, they have extended it. Um, but um, yes, you're absolutely right. In terms of safeguarding, um, I am really reluctant to um, allow my students to go and do those without somebody who's actually monitoring them. Um, if I have um, maybe a TA, um, absolutely we can use them with grown-ups. Yeah, um, I do run a couple of um, a couple of computing classes where I do have students going into the breakout rooms, but um, they are monitored with um, an adult. So we actually have um, a, a number of, um, of teachers who are there, and they all go out and they're they're working with smaller groups. 
but I certainly wouldn't do that with um, anything else. Okay, so yes. Absolutely. So for CAS communities, these are really powerful because you can actually run them as if you were running your proper CAS community where they break out into little rooms and then you come back together. <laughs>